Well, good morning, and Merry Christmas to all of you, and I trust that you are doing all well, and you have already enjoyed and rejoiced during this Christmas season, and that you have been blessed. I know that we have a lot of guests here from far away, and some from in town, just they knew that we had a Christmas morning service, and we are glad that you join us. I know that uh, Elena and I, we have been richly blessed during this Christmas season already. We seems like the last two days, we've just been busy celebrating with family and spending time with family and uh, being reminded of the coming of Christ. And it's been already a great and a blessed time. And I trust that that has been, uh, that is true to you as well. And most importantly is that we celebrate the coming of Jesus. And the worship leaders led us in the Christmas songs uh, were beautiful songs, and I really just enjoyed worshiping together with you here this morning on Christmas morning and uh, singing praises to God for His coming. Well, this today is Christmas, which means also after today, then it kind of the Christmas season that goes away, uh, whatever Christmas celebration means to you. Uh, we were in our series of messages that was because through the coming of Christ. Uh, we have life, we have peace, we have joy. Last Sunday we looked at peace. Uh, to me that's always a very precious one, uh, that God came to bring peace. Today we want to look at, through the coming of Christ, we have love. And so when I think about that uh, because Jesus Christ has come, we have now real love. Uh, God sent his precious son, into a sin-soaked world to die an awful death, a substitutionary death on a cross for undeserved sinners because of the love of God. It's just because of love. Because of God loves us so much. So when we look at Christmas, it's, it spotlights the unbelievable, unconditional, unmatchable love. The love that God has for us. So there may be, uh, there may be not a Bible verse, an entire Bible, that is putting the spotlight on so clearly as our verse that we all know by heart and by memory. That is John 3.16. And so John 3.16 will be our key verse for this morning. I want to read it to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So we celebrate joyfully the coming of Jesus because he came so that when we will, will now will leave this earth, then we will go to heaven. And that was the reason he came to save us. He came to save us from condemnation. Jesus himself says in, in John chapter 6, verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus says, His Father has sent him from heaven on a mission that had never been done and will never be repeated. And what was the mission? When, when you look at our key verse in John chapter 3, 17, right below it, Jesus, uh, the scripture reveals that. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus Christ, he came not into this world to condemn the world, the people to hell. That had already been done in the Garden of Eden. Sin entered. And so therefore, the world was pronounced condemned. But now in Christmas, we celebrate this, this unfolding eternal plan of God to rescue people. He had that plan. Jesus isn't like a lifeguard that stands at the end of a pool and screams at you and yells at you and says, you are going to drown, you're going to drown, you're going to go drown and, and go, going to be condemned. 
He dove down into this world, into our mess, into our condemnation to save everyone that is willing to be saved. And what was the Father's motivation for doing this? What, what motivated God to do this for us? Love. It was the love of God that he has for his people that motivate him. Let, let's take a moment and just, I want to show you three amazing aspects of God's love. First, we celebrate on Christmas God's love that is universal. Look again in, in, in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world. So God loves you, and there is not a thing you can do about it. Let me say that again. God loves you, and there is not a thing that you can do about it. Even though the world does not love God, but God loves the world, and there is not a thing that we can do to change that. And when he says God loves the world, he's not talking about the soil or, or he talks about people. The word world here means people. And he loves the world. He loves the people. 2 Corinthians 5.9 is just an incredible verse. It says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against him, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. You know, there are people that would like to limit the love of God. There's people that think that God will only love those that will love him back. Or they think that there's only a, 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 a chosen group or a, a select group of people that God loves and he doesn't love the rest. But that does not line up with the rest of the scriptures in God's word. In fact, who did Jesus command his disciples to love? He said, you need to even love your enemies. And he said that and explained that, how that works in Matthew 5, 46. He says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. Jesus says anyone can love the one that will love him back. That's easy, he says. But we are not to love like the world loves. So God leaves us the example how we ought to love others. And how did God left that example? By loving the world. He doesn't just love those that will love him. He doesn't just love the ones that he knows that are going to love him back. He says, God, so love the world. You know, there are about 7.7 .7 billion people today on earth. And you may wonder, well, how do you know, Pastor? Well, I counted it myself. Uh, no, I mean, excuse me, I Googled it myself. I Googled it myself. <laughs> As of September of this year, they say there's 7.7 .7 billion people alive today on earth. If you would, or could, I should say, if you could line them all up, I mean, including yourselves, including me, 7.7 .7 billion people, and then they would all step in front of the face of God. Do you know what he would tell them, every single one of them? I love you. God would say to everyone, I love you. Let, let that sink into your heart also this morning. Jesus came into the world because God loves you. So let it just sink into your heart. God loves you. You know, there's people that go through life that have never experienced what true love, unconditional love, really means. They have never experienced that. God loves you. You are included in the 7.7 .7 billion. I, I did not search that on Google, but I know that you were included. 
So nobody is excluded from the love of God. So, so the scripture here says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say God tolerates people or pities people or puts up with people, but he loves people. This word love means undying, unyielding, unconditional. It means what Lamentations chapter 322 says. And it says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. So Christmas celebrates that God loves you, and that love is not based on what you do. It is not based on your performance. This is, he loves us, that is based on who he is in his character. His character is love. God's love is universal. God loves broken, sinful people. And if we are honest, that's all there is. And he loves them. And then Jesus tells us something else that we celebrate, or this passage tells us something else that we celebrate of the love of God. Christmas celebrates that God's love is sacrificial. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. You know, in a different translation, it says begotten Son. We, we no longer use that word. It's, it's an old English word, and we don't use it anymore. But really what that means is one of a kind. This is one of a kind. This is not just talk. This is fact. God demonstrates his love for the world by giving his son to the world. Real love always involves real sacrifice. See, when two people get married, they have to sacrifice singleness. They have to sacrifice some freedom. They cannot now just go and do whatever they want. They have to sacrifice energy. There's a lot of sacrifices that they make for one another when they get married because they have real love. Real love is always willing to sacrifice for the need of the other. And you know, God's love for us was he was willing to personally sacrifice to provide for us what we really needed. And God did that. And what is, what is it that the world needs the most? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. 1 John 4, 10 says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loves us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus said he came down from heaven to do what the Father had told him to do. And what had he told him to do? Save sinners. How? By sacrificing himself, dying on a cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He died to provide us what we could not get any other way. And that was the motivation was love. Unconditional love. He provided it so we could have forgiveness of our sins. And now my last point, Christmas celebrates that God's love is available. If you look at the last part in John 3:16, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want you to, to really get this next statement. While God loves people unconditionally, he does not save people unconditionally. That, that's where we don't want to get it mixed up. While he loves people, he does not save all people. Jesus said, God the Father saves everyone who believes in, trusts in Jesus, the Son of God. He will save everyone. So you cannot stop God loving you, but you can't stop God saving you. Because you, here he says, if we refuse to wholeheartedly believe in and trust in, then he's not going to save. But he says, whoever believes, 
will not perish. So he loves you unconditionally, but he doesn't save you unconditionally. Forgiveness is available, but it's not automatic. Salvation is available, but it's not automatic. Heaven is available to us, but it's not automatic. God will not save a person who refused to be saved. So that means that we have to be willing. We, we, we surrender to Christ. We surrender ourselves. And we say, Jesus, I trust you to do what you say you will do. You know, that is what, that's what faith is. That's what, that's what belief is. That's what trust is. That we trust that he will save us. We will do what he says he will do. So God will not save anybody who thinks he can save himself. Or is not willing to truly in her heart believe that what Jesus will do for him that he says he will do. When we come to the place where we just realize that we are hopeless and we are in a situation where there is just hopeless and, and no hope for us and without the intervention of Christ and we place our faith and trust in him, that's when we get saved. So we must do that. We must surrender and believe that he died for our sins. He was risen for, uh, from the dead and he will forgive and save everyone who believes and trusts in him. Love came down from heaven to took on flesh on that first Christmas. Love humbled himself and was nailed to the cross on that first Good Friday. Love was resurrected from the grave on the first Easter. And that love was God's love. That love was God's son. That is the love that is our hope that is in Jesus Christ, that he came to save sinners. And he came, not that we deserved it, not that we did something good, but he came, it was motivated by his love. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let, let me read it one more time. I'm going to, Put some pen or translation into this. For God so loved Ben that he gave his only begotten son that if Ben will believe, then Ben will not perish, but Ben will have eternal life. That's what Christ came to do. And it was be motivated by the love of God. That is valid for you, Ben. That is valid for any one of you. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what we celebrate. That's why we are filled with joy. Because of the love of God. If it wasn't for the love of God, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for the love of God, we wouldn't celebrate Christmas. But he loved us. And then he came and provided salvation. And we celebrate and we rejoice in that. Merry Christmas.